Psalm 133. I'm going to start with that one, guys. Psalm 133, and then I'll hit the other ones here and there. Thank you for helping me out. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So it's unpleasant if there's, if there's discord. Um, it's unpleasant if there's discord in a house. It's unpleasant if you work in a company where there's a lot of discord. It's unpleasant in a church where there's a lot of discord. Unpleasant to be on a team where there's a lot of discord. But how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity, okay? It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron. You say, who in the world is Aaron and what is the oil? Uh, God pulled Israel out of Egypt and he used Moses to do that. But you gotta understand, theologians say that was about 3.5 million people living in sand. They had no houses. They had no judicial system. They had no emergency system. They had no law system. They had no moral code. They didn't know their God. They didn't know him. So God gave them 10 commandments to let them to know a moral code. Okay, this is a little bit about what I'm about. Here's the 10 commandments. Then they start setting up uh, Moses being a judge between all the people, this and that and other. So then God says, I want worship. I want worship to be established. I want to love on them and I want them to love on me. So they needed a priest to lead in worship and Aaron was chosen. And when he was anointed, the, the oil run down his head, run down the beard, running to the edge of his garment. So what does that mean? In the New Testament, in our eyes, that's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that means whatever God is going to do, let, I'm still in my introduction, I'm just reading scripture. Whenever God is going to do something, he's going to send it to leadership. And then the oil has to flow. Okay? The key is it has to be just the same in purity and substance and essence when it hits the edge of the garment as it was when it went to the head. Okay? That looks good on paper, but ask anybody who runs a corporation, that's hard to pull off. Very difficult, still difficult even in a church. One thing I can't stand is to be misrepresented. That's one thing I teach my staff all the time. This is how I treat people, this is how I do things. Have you ever heard me holler at anybody? Have you ever heard me smart off anybody? Have you ever seen me treat him? And no, they haven't, why? Because I want the oil of the way I do things to flow all the way down to the, to the person who just got saved 30 minutes ago. That's the edge of the garment. So if God is gonna send a healing anointing to this church, guess what he's gonna do? He's gonna send it to Ron. And then it's not for Ron, it's for a flow. And it's supposed to touch everybody under the sound of my voice. If God's gonna send a get out of debt anointing, guess what? You're gonna have to clap when God gets me out of debt. You should want good things to happen to me if this is true. Okay, because when something good happens to me, guess what that means? You're next. So anytime anything good happens to me, hallelujah, the oil's about to flow. And if God's got a freedom anointing, a peace anointing, a out of debt anointing, a healing anointing, I don't care what, it, whatever he sends, somebody clap if you know you're next. You're gonna get that thing. If God blesses me, you next in line for a blessing. If God does something great in my marriage, you're about to fall in love with your wife again. Come on, somebody. Whatever it is, you're next. I can tell this is going to be a good one, too. Yeah, I can already tell. I was a little worried y'all had praised all your energy out, but I can tell you saved a little something. Running down to the edge of the garments. Next verse. It's like the dew of Hermon descending on the mountains of Zion. For there, where is there? where the brethren dwell together in unity. For there, where? Unity. People that are together, people that are unified, thinking the same thing, speaking the same thing, that is not a cult, that's unity. And they have a purpose and they have a mission and they work at it together. God said, there, the Lord commanded the blessing. He didn't say, I bless them. It's not an action, it's a thing. He said, I will put a thing on that group of people that know how to function as a united people. Good God Almighty. 
So Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. A lot of a lot of times I, I don't ever want to go back to being where Hope and I were. <clears throat> Hope was in a little bit better situation where she was raised in than I was. She's still raised in southern small town America. But her mom and dad did well for where they were at. We were people of very, very modest means, and I'm just, I'll leave it at that. Because I hate these stories where everybody tries to find out who was the poorest. <clears throat> but there's something that I think having great resources sometimes will rob you of. Sometimes when you have great resources, it robs you of little opportunities to believe God. Some people really wonder, like, man, you, you, you're in your 50s and you're up there and you're acting like a kid and you, and you sweat and you jump and you run and you're passionate and you cry and you holler and you, and then, why? You know, pastor, does it really take all that? Absolutely, it takes all that and it takes more. Why? Because I've seen too much. And you don't have a book or a theology that can talk me out of what I experience. Your experience will never bow to someone else's argument. Ever. I have seen Hope and myself hungry in a little beat up, run down, what you would call ghetto home with no heat in the winter. Not California winters. Winter winters. With nothing to eat and us grab hands in the floor and believe God for groceries and go open the front door and there's a bag of groceries on the front porch. So, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna stop jumping. I'm just going she's not either, hallelujah. Do you see what I'm talking about? I, I, I've seen we didn't have insurance and the bill was so high at the minute clinic for all the times we didn't pay where my kid was burning up with a fever of 104 and they wouldn't see him. And she brought him back home and we had no other, God had to break the fever. We didn't have any medicine, no doctor would see us. We had God. And sometimes it's easier to just pop two Tylenol than to believe God to heal your headache. Sometimes it's easier to pull out your American Express than it is to believe God for the money. This is so good today. <clears throat> it's not a sin, it's not wrong, but just some just robs you sometime of, of the small opportunities to just see God. God loves doing that kind of stuff for you. He loves it. God is, you gotta understand, God is a major, major show off. And he loves to show you his kindness and his goodness and what he can do. And, and so we've had many, many experiences that have led us to believe God on a large level like we do today. I've said all that to say this. I, I went over these scriptures last week. I'm gonna bear down here again. It's not because I don't have anything to say. I wanna connect last week and this week together because it is very powerful in its essence if you can grasp everything that I'm trying to put together. A lot of people ask me, they say, Pastor, why don't we see miracles? And, and why don't see, we see signs and wonders and see God do all these crazy, unexplainable things like we see in the Bible, like we see Jesus did, like we see in the book of Acts that the early church did. And we just don't see those things anymore. And I agree with you. I agree with you. We've made church so corporate and so entertainment driven that I, most church people would not know if God's in the building or not. Uh, one of the scariest verses in the Bible was Samson. Samson kept playing with God. And he said, I'll snap these cords as I did before. And then the last time it said, and the glory of God had departed and he didn't even know it. And he went to pull those cords and they didn't break. And the glory had left him. He didn't even know the glory had left him. I, I think there's a, the glory has left a lot of churches, but they got enough lights and smoke. They can keep the show going and they don't even know God's not there. 
you know God's on a place because the anointing destroys the yoke and removes the burden. If people come here every single week and leave the exact same way they came, and they don't grow, and they don't increase, and they don't fall in love, and they're not a little bit freer, and they're not a little bit wiser, and they haven't grown a little bit more, then something is bad missing in the church. <laughs> I've seen signs, I've seen wonders, I've seen miracles. I remember, I remember my father, my father's daddy was just a bunch of, just, I don't know how to say it, just a bunch of drunks. Just everybody was 24 hour a day drunks. That's what they were. And my dad was playing in a rock band as a teenager. He got saved while he's playing in that rock band. How many of you have ever heard of Oral Roberts? You ever heard of Oral Roberts? Oral Roberts took God and put him on TV. I mean, he took miracles and put miracles right in front of everybody on TV. And he was way, 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 way ahead of his time. And my dad said, I got saved. He said, I didn't know really a lot about God or about church because everybody in his family was just like heathens, you know. So he said, I heard about this old Roberts, this guy who had this healing ministry. He was coming and doing a crusade. He said, so I went down there and volunteered to help out for the crusade. And he, uh, old Robert had this tent that he would bring in semi-trucks and they held 10,000 people. So he had this big tent he would set up in these cities that held 10,000 people. And he would sit on this platform on a chair and sick people would line up for hours and one by one they would come and he would pray for them and God would do miracles. My dad said, well, when I volunteered, they stationed me right at the foot of the stage, right where his chair was. He said, so I've been saved about a week. And he said, and oh, Roberts is sitting right here so I could reach up and touch him. He said, and he told me, he said, Ron, he called me Ron Jr. He said, Ron Jr., he said, I remember one lady walking up with a gorder on her neck so big that it pushed her head to the side. He said, and she walked up to be prayed for. He said, he took his hand and slapped it on her neck. He said, and that tumor fell off her neck and fell right down at my feet. He said, and I looked up at her neck and the flesh was closed and it was perfect. And look, nobody went crazy and ran laps and everything. Why? Because it was expected. It was expected. If we had happened to somebody in here, we'd be in church seven hours because we'd be rejoicing so much. Why? Because it would be so uncommon. But it was expected. Old Roberts didn't sit there and grab the mic and tell everybody to praise God. You know what he said? Next. Next. Because when he laid hands on the woman, he expected the tumor to leave. By the power of God. If Hollywood can talk about the power of demons in every movie, can the church not invite the Holy Ghost back into the building and say, maybe, just maybe, God might want to heal, deliver, set free somebody. Maybe you don't need to go to council in two years. Maybe somebody can touch you one time and you'll never do those drugs again. One time. There's some anointing so powerful that if they touch you one time, you will never be the same. Somebody that believes in a church like that, give God five seconds of praise because I prophesy not only can it happen, we will be that church. Somebody shout hallelujah. High five your neighbors say, that's us, that's us, that's us. Mm. <laughs> now, The Bible said that Jesus at age 30 was filled with the Holy Spirit and he functioned, remember last week, in the Holy Spirit without measure. So when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for those of you that are new to your Christian faith, those are the four books of the Bible that chronicle the life and the teachings of Jesus, okay? When you read those full Bibles, it is nothing but full chock full of miracles. Going from one miracle to the next miracle. Okay? Because that's what somebody full of the Holy Spirit did. The Bible says he went into towns, listen, I, that, healing all that were sick and afflicted of the devil. Every insane asylum. Their minds were made right. Every person sick, their bodies were made whole. Every person 
that was in any way in bondage. They would take people that they deemed to be mentally insane or that many times they thought were demon possessed. They would exile them to islands and chain them because they couldn't control them. And Jesus would leave the crowds and go to the island. And they would cry out when they saw him coming. And Jesus would go there and set the demoniacs free. And the Bible say, and they would come up in their right mind. Good God, hallelujah. I'm, this was common. Not common and insignificant, but it was an expected part of the Holy Spirit filled Jesus without measure ministry. Now, this gets into the guts of last week's teaching. Let me bog down right here. Are we still together? Wait, okay. okay. The Bible says that we have a measure. Okay? That's the problem. We getting in services where there are small measures so we see a little bit done. I have a measure. You 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 have a measure. But nobody in here has the full measure. The Bible says we have a measure of faith. It's just off the top of my head. We don't all have the same faith. I told you last week the analogy of my wife. My wife has a great, great measure of faith. She just has the ability to believe God. It's really inspirational. I tend to struggle because I want to figure it out. The Bible doesn't say figure it out. It says all things are possible to him that believes. God didn't say to all him that can figure out how I'm going to do it. He just said believe him. And she has really tapped into that. And I've seen great things come to our family, not because of my faith, but because of hers. We have a measure of faith. There's some people that can believe God for great things. There's some people that struggle to get there because there are measures of faith. The Bible says we have measures of talent. There is, a, there is the possibility of equality, but there will never be the, the possibility of ident being identical. We do not have the same stuff. Period. We just don't have it. Okay? I told Hope, I said, I wanted to break out in a song so bad during that worship. She said, why didn't you? I said, because I didn't know if my voice would do it. <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to open my mouth wide and just reach for something. But the problem is, you would have had to endure it to see if I could make it happen. <laughs> I don't have Lizzie's measure. To one he gave five talents, to one he gave two, to one he gave one. I don't understand why he does it that way. And the Bible says this, says he distributes it as he wills. That's why I hate it when you go to a motivational speakers conference and I got this jet and you can have one. To no, everybody's not gonna have a jet. It's a lie. I'm gonna save you your $10,000. It's a lie. Everybody does not have the same stuff. The Bible says we have measures of grace. Has something crushed you? It means you didn't have the grace for it. I want to start my own business. Well, okay, do you have the grace for it? It's on his back now. What if they take all of it and throw it on your back? Are you graceful? There's things that one person stood under that wiped somebody else out, the very same thing, because they had different measures of grace. I am. Different measures of grace. Well, I want to marry him, Mom. I know he's kind of a project. Well, do you have the grace <laughs> for the project? Men go into marriage, you know, women go into marriage saying I can change him. Men go into marriage scared to death she's going to change. <laughs> Come to the marriage conference. Hallelujah. <laughs> Different measures of grace. The Bible says we have different measures of gift. I'm, there's five. I got four of them off the top of my head. Measures. I don't have it without measure. I have a limit. In all those areas, I have a limit. I try not to ever get out of my grace. Pastor, you need to start another one of these in San Francisco and LA. And I'm like, no, I need to build the one I have now. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Why? Can it be done? Possibly. But right now, that would be above my grace. My hands are full right now. So we have a measure. Now, go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and I think it's verse 12. 
1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is not Jesus, Christ. Don't want to insult your intelligence. Remember I told you Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is descriptive of his function. He is Jesus the Christ. The Christ means the anointing, which means full of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus the man that will walk in the earth full of the Holy Spirit of God. That is what Jesus Christ is. The man Jesus died went back to heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father. Christ, the anointing, never left the earth. The anointing is still in the earth. The problem is, at one time, it sat on the physical body of Jesus and Jesus functioned in the Holy Spirit without measure. And signs, wonders, and miracles were every chapter in that Bible. But now it has moved. Because Jesus no longer has a physical body here. He has his spiritual body. The Bible says we are the body of Christ and that body having member, many members is one body. So just like my body has many members, but it makes up the person called Ron, we have many members of the body of Christ, but it makes up one body. Herein is why I believe we don't see things we used to see, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, put that on there if you would. I think it's around verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Now, verse 10 before that says, he who descended, talking about Jesus, when he died, the Bible says he descended into the depths of the earth. I preached that last Easter. A lot of stuff took place those three days Jesus was dead. And the Bible says when he ascended, he descended, and when he ascended, he gave gifts to men. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. Saints, somebody say, that's me. That's me, okay? So there's something God wants to do with his people. He left these five gifts to do it. They are for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. See, that messes with us right there, just that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we give offerings so that we can pay professional ministries who've been to seminaries to do ministry. My job is not to do all the ministry. If I did, this church would have 30 people. My job is to quit equip people to understand the power you have and you're not using right now. Walking around with dormant gifts on the inside of you that have never been activated. You are a walking nuclear power plant and nobody's even told you. Nobody's ever laid hands on you. Nobody's ever activated. You got stuff in you that if you made a demand on it would come out of you, you wouldn't believe but you just haven't been around the right people, you haven't been around in the room, you haven't heard the right teachers, and you haven't been in the right environment. And all that can change your life radically. Whipping of the saints for the edifying of the body of the anointing. Edifying, building an edifice, building a building. It's a bunch of scattered people and I gave these five gifts, why? Because how good and pleasant it is when they dwell together in unity and the oil flows. So they're not together right now, so I'm leaving these five gifts to build this edifice called the body of the anointing. <sighs> Till we all come to, there it is again, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, that don't mean without flaws, it means mature. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of the anointing. I have a measure, you have a measure, but when we come into unity, 
and we become one, we operate in the full measure just like the man Jesus when he walked the earth. I took 20 minutes to relay that foundation. Please clap if you got it. It's very important that you just got what I said. And that right there. And let me tell you how I know God is doing something unifying in this, in this room. Because I feel the intensity of spiritual pressure going up every time we come in here. What is it we are after? When this becomes the body of the anointing, there's no one in particular that's got to touch you for anything to happen. People can just come sit beside you. I mean, the same anointing on you is on me. The same anointing on me is on you. And you say, yeah, but man, I, I just, I deliver mail by eight hours a day. I mean, I ain't never been, it don't have nothing to do with Bible school and cemetery. It has to do with being a part of an anointed body of Christ. It has something to do with understanding that God can create an atmosphere. And that's why this praise and worship thing I'm doing the first of the year, when we get the protocols of praise down and you understand what's happening, why you think it looks foolish when I tell you what's really happening. And when you get the protocols of worship down and then all of a sudden we understand we are the body of Christ and we get to functioning with the understanding all at the same time and we become mature people and God has unified us. And then all of a sudden that measure starts increasing and that measure all of a sudden, what ha what's going to happen? People are going to come running because you ain't got to touch Ron. You ain't got to come to an altar. Nobody's got to pour olive oil on you. All you got to do is get in the room and son, the, the, your son can be free from drug addiction. Get in the room and the tumor will shrink. Get in the room and the marriage can be restored. Get in the room and everybody lost will get saved. Now, you may not believe that there can be a church like that, but I am here because I believe God has called us to be a church like that where people say all I gotta do if I can just get there if I, I know we're going to drive five hours but honey if I can just get you there you can pull those things out your nose and get that stuff out of your vein and God will heal your body if you have the faith to believe God can do it right here with us somebody take five seconds and shout hallelujah hallelujah one more time shout hallelujah Tell them again, say, that's us. Tell you never, that's us. Hey. Mm. Hey. Don't you do that. Thank you, Lord. Let the full measure begin. Let the full measure begin. You want to praise him? Come on. Hey! Just give him a praise. I know you got one in you. Give him some glory. I know you got. Hey! You got to get it out quick. I got to hurry. Come on. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him, praise him, look at me, praise him. Four, three, two, one. Yo, guys, I got to finish. I got to finish. Now, all right. I was gonna use my little dry erase board. We got it all shined up, <laughs> but I'm not. I just need you to follow me. Jesus, the anointing without measure. The body of Christ collectively, the fullness of his measure. So you now have the anointing on Jesus. You have the corporate anointing. The corporate anointing has two arms. Revelation with one, please. Verse five and six. Revelation one. 
Revelation. Revelation is not a book. I don't preach from it a lot because you can spend your whole life trying to learn this one book. And I'm not an end time specialist. But Revelation is not a book, it was a vision. John said he was called into the third heaven. There are three heavens. The third one is the abode of God. Said he was called up and then he said, write down what you see. So Revelation is a vision and John wrote it down. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler over all the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests. Jesus, the anointing without measure, the corporate anointing, the fullness of that measure, the kingly and the priestly anointing. I'll land this plane in just a second. John the Baptist and Jesus were connected in ministry. They were even connected at birth. They were cousins. When Mary and Joseph left in fear for the child's life in her womb, she went to see Elizabeth, who was carrying John the Baptist, who would be Jesus' cousin. And I love this. I might preach it during Christmas. And the Bible says when Mary and Elizabeth came within distance of each other, their babies leapt in their wombs. I want to be around people that make my baby jump. If you can't make my baby jump, I'm going to get in another room. Okay. John the Baptist, 30, now we flip to 30 years old, he is the man. He's alone on the wild side. He lives out in the wilderness. The Bible says he eats locusts and wild honey. I wouldn't want that diet. But the Bible said people would run to hear him. The magnitude of the way God was using him was so powerful, people did whatever they had to get around him. But he would often say, I'm not the one. I'm predicting the one. I'm prophesying the one. He said, there's one coming after me, the thongs of his sandals I am not worthy to untie. And then he, when Jesus came, he pointed him out and said, behold, look, don't look, quit looking at me, look at him. The lamb that takes away the sins of the world. He must increase, I must decrease. Okay. John the Baptist was raised in the home of a priest. What did John the Baptist do? He couldn't bring the revival. All he could do is say, it's coming. It's coming. Get ready. Repent. The kingdom is at hand. Prepare yourself. Prepare the way. It's, that's all he could do. Because that is the priestly anointing. I carry a priestly anointing. Some of you may think, man, we need some more guys like Ron Carpenter right here and really bring revival to California and really bring revival to this coast and really bring revival to the southern region and really bring break. You got it all backwards. All I can do is say it's coming. That's all I can do. Jesus was not raised in the home of a preacher. Jesus was raised in the home of a businessman. Jesus didn't work in church. Jesus worked in the marketplace. John the Baptist said it's coming. Jesus brought it. The priestly announces, the kingly brings it. You have it all wrong who's the really powerful one in this building. I'm anointed to say it's coming. You're anointed to bring it. You're anointed to bring it. 
Somebody that knows you're anointed to bring it, clap loud, brother. You are anointed to bring it. You have a kingly anointing. The corporate anointing is made up of kings and priests. I am a priest and I prophesy it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But I gotta have some people that when you walk out that back door, you believe I'm gonna bring it back in here with me. Shout amen, amen, and amen. I'm trying to finish. I know the game started. Just, ah. I'm doing my best, y'all. I really am. <laughs> Pastor, what am I bringing? <laughs> Three things. There is supposed to be a transfer in the earth before the second return of Christ. All of the people who study prophetic literature, they look at what's going on in the world. I look at what's going on in the church. And there are things that have to happen in the church before Jesus returns. That's why I do not believe he's coming back tomorrow at 11 o'clock. The first thing is there has to be a transfer of systems. Revelation 1, please. Or maybe it's, what's the other revelation? Hit it, guys, whichever one it is, y'all know. Revelation 11, I'm sorry. The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, that's Jesus, and of his Christ, his anointed. Who is that now? The kingdoms of this world have shifted and are now under the dominion of the Lord and his people. Remember I told you way back there's a difference between the earth and the world? The earth is a planet, the world is systems. There has to be a shift in the governance of the system. That's what you bring. I can't do it. Well, Ron, won't you run for governor? I don't want to. You do it. Proverbs 13. Throw that up there, guys, if you can. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children, children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So those of you that don't like being generous, you're going to have a lid on your life because God has anointed you to go out there and make a wealth transfer and put it in your hands. In fact, he said in James chapter one, I don't worry about the wealth increasing with the sinners. He said, I'm letting them heap it up just so it is transferred into the hands of the righteous. Somebody ought to be throwing chairs and running around this building right now. I can't bring that. And then the third one, of course, is people. From the corporate anointing, there's a kingly and a priestly. I announce what God wants to do. And you're anointed to do it. Folks, play something if you would. Is it, is it really, is it, is it all right? All right. Play something. The Bible says, I'll tell you what, go ahead and stand up with me. Go ahead and stand up. I'm, I'm going to get you out of here. <clears throat> if you can give me 90 more seconds. The Bible says that in the fullness of time, Jesus was born. We're coming up on that season. That word fullness of time means a strategic time. Jesus was born at just the right time. If you study history, there's been many empires. Jesus was born specifically during the Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire was the greatest physical demonstration of what his kingdom would operate like. That's why the Roman centurion caught on the fastest. 
He said, oh, I know what's going on here. You ain't got to come to my house. Just speak a word. And he looked at the Roman centurion and looked at the box. He said, I ain't seen faith like this in none of y'all. He caught on to it fast because of their similarities. Caesar, the emperor of Rome, had a meeting of all the governors once a year. Remember Pontius Pilate? He was a governor. Those are regional magistrates. One time a year, all of the regional magistrates and governors had to come to a meeting called by Caesar in Rome. Do you know what that meeting was called? It was called this in the Greek, ecclesia. Do you know what the Greek word ecclesia is? Church. He had a meeting of all of his rulers and called it church. Because church is and is always supposed to have been a gathering of rulers. That's why Jesus is the king of kings. There's many kings, but he's the king of all the kings. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. May he establish you and give you peace and give you the greatest week you've ever had. God bless you. Enjoy your day. Thank you for being patient with me. We'll see you next week.